dispense tudo vai aqui. Okay. Please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Chapter 6. There are free seats on the front row if you want to move up to one of the uh, prime pieces of real estate in our auditorium. <laughs> front row seats available. Isaiah chapter 6. Today's message, we will actually be looking at sort of a theme in primarily in the New Testament. And uh, but I, I want to want to pick up kind of where we were last week, and especially if you weren't in our service last week, we've begun our series on separation. I have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, before we begin in our in our message this morning, I was sort of unrelated. I didn't want to make them for announcements or anything, but I just wanted to mention some. Uh, just some things for, to, to ask you to pray about. We have been, for years, seeing a need in our ministry uh, for a, a addictions uh, help, or addictions recover. There are a lot of people who are struggling with having victory of pornography, drinking, smoking, um, lying, honesty, character, just all kinds of uh, drugs, narcotics, and that sort of any anything that is a besetting sin, something that a believer deals with and uh, doesn't have victory over, and it's God. God has the answers for those things. The Bible has the answers for those for everything that a Christian deals with. And God's plan for every believer is for us to live fruitful, victorious lives. A lot of a lot of Christians honestly just don't know what to do. The churches and preaching today is so oftentimes diluted that the truth of the Scripture is confusing. Believers don't even have clarity about right and wrong. We actually live in a generation today where if, maybe not in this church, but if I were to stand up in the average uh, church and say, God hates alcohol, believers would say, well, Pastor, I don't really agree with that. I'm not sure, you know, Jesus made water into wine. And uh, you, you know, start off on that sort of a tangent, that kind of a thread. And my friend, Jesus did not make alcohol. Wine is the fruit of the vine, but a lot of people don't know that. And the Bible's really, really clear about whether or not a believer ought to drink alcohol. But you know there's a lot of believers that just don't know it's wrong. Talk about immorality, physical immorality, uh, and just moral purity and cleanness. And a lot of believers don't even know about it. Worse, though, than believers not having answers for those things is the reality that the world doesn't know that we have the answers. Whereas lost people don't know we have the answers. In Southeast Florida, this is the mecca of drug addiction and treatment centers. Literally, people from around the country and even around the world move to the Palm Beaches all the way uh, down to Miami-Dade County in order to get help with addiction. And most of the time, or much of the time, they end up just dropping out of whatever treatment center they're part of and just living here as a either functional or dysfunctional addict. And I just want to tell you something, the treatment centers don't have the answer. They don't have Jesus, and we do. And so we've been praying for years about addictions recovery. There's a, a biblically-based uh, program called RU. It's an acronym or initials for Reformers Unanimous, but it really is a Christian discipleship program that teaches believers how to have a relationship with God that supplants or eliminates the place that in their heart for their addictions. And that's about as quickly as I can encapsulate that. This last week, Brother Tashi Simmons, he's out of town uh, right now. He had, he had to go to Virginia. But uh, we, we went up to Rockford, Illinois, and spent the week at a... Um, conference uh, that in the local church that really has developed the program and tries to help other churches to establish it. I said all that to say this. We don't know what we're going to do. We've, we've desired to have a, that type of a ministry for a long time, but it's a major, major commitment. It's one of those things where anyone who's involved with it really needs to commit to at least 45 Friday nights out of the year for the Friday night, uh, uh, for the Friday night part of the program. 
and it's one of those things that you need probably 10 to 15 workers for. It's, it's just a lot. And for a church our size, you look around and say 10 to 15 workers with a church that a lot of the workers are already doing everything, that's a lot. But would you just pray and ask God maybe if He would, if, if it's something that He wants you to do, you're looking for an outlet or an avenue for ministry, something you could be involved in. One of the themes that Tashi and I took away last week was that every director of the RU program said, this program changed me. And most of them weren't people who were struggling with addictions. It's just that when they really got into their relationship and walked with the Lord, they realized, wow, you know, this is something I need. And uh, man, I'll tell you, the churches that are doing it are reaching scores of lost people. I mean, all kinds of lost people. We can literally go into the... Uh, emergency rooms of all the hospitals and get them to send people to us for help. We can go into the HR to the HR department of businesses and actually uh, have an, an uh, accredited, uh, I forget what the acronym they have for uh, ministries that struggle, I mean not ministries, for employees. EAP. Thank you, EAP. And yeah, go with their people that are involved with EAP and actually uh, have them send their employees to our church for help. And friend, the best thing about it is we can help them. Like what we have will help them is Jesus. And so anyway, if you would just just be praying and say, God, you know, you know, I don't know. You know tell me if this would be, if, if I had a list of people uh, that would want to be involved with the program and uh, that would be something that would help me as far as decision makings. One of the things that they said last week in almost every session we attended though was pastor cannot be the RU director. It's not possible. The pastor cannot be the RU director. He can be involved in RU, but he can't be the director. It's just it would be too much, it would take away too much from the ability to minister as a pastor in the church. And so uh, Brother Tashi's praying whether the Lord would have him to direct the program. He's uh, doing the material regardless whether um, whether he gets you know, becomes a director or not, he's doing the daily journals and those things just for uh, the personal edification of it. And I went to RU uh, in another church about 10 years ago for about a year, a year and a half. Was how long did we go to RU, Charlie? Yeah, close, to close to a year and a half when we attended, and it was really a helpful discipleship program. So that has nothing to do with the message this morning. But in case you were praying, you knew that we were going to go to that seminar last week or the conference, whatever they call that thing. And it was a pretty intensive conference. It was really a benefit and a help. That's a little bit of a report for you about it. In Isaiah chapter 6, I want to read last week's text again to just kind of bring us back to where we were when we left off last week in our series as we introduced ourselves to the biblical doctrine or teaching of separation. The Bible says in verse 1 in the year that Uzziah, King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. One had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, in a way, because of the wings on these, uh, on, on these seraphims, because of the wings on them, I see sort of an eagle. Like, I see them more like eagles or osprey wings. I'm personally more of a fan of osprey than eagles. An eagle is a majestic creature until you observe them in a city dump. And uh, so I'm more of an osprey person. I know eagles do hunt and so forth, but in some ways... And like a bald eagle, they're sort of vultures as far as the way that they, the things they eat and so forth. They're not as beautiful a creature, but they, they are pretty to look at uh, in eagles. And when I was a kid growing up, our family had kind of a historical uh, landmark in the state of Kansas, in Salina, Kansas. My family owned the uh, Indian burial grounds. There was a place where literally hundreds of Native Americans had lived. They had lodges and you know, it wasn't like you think about with teepees. They had buildings and lodges and those sort of things. And that was on our uh, family's property. But something else they had that was unique was a burial ground. 
and they actually had something had happened. It looked like a sickness, didn't look like a war, where literally hundreds, we don't know, maybe even thousands of people all died, and they just did a massive burial where they placed them and buried them, brought up sand from the river. And archaeologists back in, I think, the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, they exhumed or they, they, they went through the sites and they exposed a small part of that. And that was actually open to the public until the 1990s and our family uh, ran or owned that property. And uh, in the room, in that room, that the burial ground is, is just, a, that's not the point of the story, but in the room where you could see the pit where uh, the bodies were that you could just look at how they were buried and so forth. In the corner of it, we had something, I don't know where they came from or how our family got it, but we had a uh, bald eagle, uh, what do they call it when they're stuffed or whatever, it was a, a taxidermy, taxidermy you know, what do they call it, a mount, a bald eagle mount hanging in the corner. Now, I was a kid at the time, and the place was closed when I think I was about 12 or 13 years old. And so, but in my estimation back then, the eagle was in a uh, spread, it was a spread eagle or spread, wing spread fashion. Back then, I want to say that the wings of that eagle were something like close to six feet wide. It seemed like that to me. I don't know if it actually was, but it was just massive. You know, and it just looked like you could stand under it like an umbrella. It was just a huge eagle mount. And so, uh, when I see this, when I read about these seraphim, I think of six wings like eagles, but I just think of them being larger. And then when I think of, in terms of eagle, when I read a, a word like one cried unto another, I think of the cry of an eagle or an osprey. I have an osprey that, he hasn't been around for a while, but an osprey that frequents my neighborhood and he likes a tree in my backyard. And he is pretty interactive. He's actually a pretty cool bird. I like osprey. They're pretty neat. And he'll sit up in the tree and if, if he doesn't know you, if you're a stranger, he'll fly off. But if he's familiar with you, he just carries on doing his fishing and hanging out in the tree just like you're not there. And he's pretty interactive. He actually talks to me. He just sits up there and just kind of does osprey cries or chirps. And trash talks me just a little bit, I think is what it is. He'll sit in the tree and he'll be looking at me and looking at the water and just kind of, he's, he's really a pretty funny bird. And uh, he'll be sitting on, perched on the tree. And all of a sudden, he looks like he's falling out of the tree. And he just goes down and he hits the water. And the osprey, uh, their, whatever their claw is, it's like a thumb. It's actually preloaded. And when it, when it hits something, it locks. And it automatically pops shut like a trap. And he'll hit the water. And he'll pull out like an 18-inch fish. And just start screaming. <coughs> at the top of his lungs and he will pull the fish out you know just depending on how big it is and he'll be pounding his way out with his wings and he'll make his way into the air and then he circles around and the whole time he's crying ee, 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 and he's loud and then he comes and he lands on the same limb that he was on before he started fishing and he stands on on uh, one claw and holds the fish in his other claw and trash talks me and just says, you know, look, I, you know, I want to show you who the fisherman is around here. The guy that really actually catches fish, not the guy that just actually goes fishing. There's fish in these waters, you know. You just don't get them. That's all. But I can get a fish, you know. And he, t I know that's what he's telling me because he just sits up there, acting smug and ripping his fish apart, and uh, just talking and chattering at you. And he's sitting there talking and looking at me, like showing me, look at my fish, you know. And you got a fish? I don't see a fish. With you. I don't see a fish in your claw. But I got a fish, you know. Anyway. But my point is, is that when I envision this, when I read this passage of Scripture, the sound of the eagle, there's an eagle that flies over our farm in Kansas, and you don't see him very often, but you can hear him just crying. And his, and his voice carries, and I just can't imagine the throne room where God is high and lifted up, and these seraphims with six wings, two covering their face, two covering their feet, and two of them flying, and just crying out to one another, Holy! 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 And I, you know, I can't do it. I can't cry out like an eagle or like an osprey, but I can hear it in my mind. I can just hear that, that uh, crying and screaming, Jesus, God, 
God is holy. He's holy. He's holy. And we know that Isaiah's response when he saw this in verse 4, he said, The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And this is a dramatic scene in the throne room of heaven where God is. And then Isaiah said, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Alas, woe. And he, he literally realizes God is holy and oh no. I'm not. And he said, because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And in verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 6 last week, we were introduced to separation. When you understand and catch a glimpse of God for whom He is, you see that not only is His holiness a righteousness, a character that separates Him from sin and from evil and from all that is evil, you also come to understand that who God is separates Him from me. Because God is holy and I'm unclean. And not only that, but Isaiah said, I'm not identified with God. I'm separated from God. But I'm identified with unclean people. He said, I dwell in the midst of a generation of people and of unclean lips. He said, I'm unclean. I live with unclean people. That's what we are. And that's who He is. And then last week we saw God's response to Isaiah's understanding of separation. By the way, you'll never come to God until you realize that He's different than you are. You never come to God until you realize you're unclean and that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God by your sin. And so Isaiah said in verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, means look or behold, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity, iniquity is sin or wickedness, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And so God is separated from us because He's holy and because we're unclean. And then we see the seraphim with the coal in His hand come and touch it to the lips of Isaiah and say, Look, this has cleaned you. This has made you clean. And then the passage that everyone preaches from Isaiah 6 or the verse, then uh, they, you see in verse 7, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Isn't that touching? You ever think about that? God is now talking to Isaiah. When Isaiah sees God, he says, God has nothing to do with me, and I have nothing to do with God because He's holy and because I'm unclean. And now Isaiah's been cleansed, and God says, Isaiah, isn't that wonderful? He said, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And folks, we ended last week understanding that separation is a Bible teaching. It's based on the character of God. In other words, the reason a person who is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who's born again, who's identified with God, the reason there is a call to separation for us is because of who God is. God is holy. And you cannot be like God and be like the wicked. But we saw how positive the doctrine of separation is. Separation isn't put your nose up in the air and realize how much better you are than people who aren't clean. Who will go for us and whom shall I send? Who does the Lord want to send cleansed Isaiah unto? The generation of people with unclean lips. The generation of the unclean. In other words, Christian... Understand this, separation, man, because of who God is, it separates us from uncleanness. But separation sends us to the unclean. And so we saw last week, practically speaking, that as soon as Isaiah was cleansed, God said, who's going to go to the unclean? And Isaiah said, lo, here am I, send me, send me. And a believer who is separated, a believer who understands separation, the Bible way, the way the Bible teaches it, doesn't withdraw himself from the world. He doesn't move outside of the world and refuse to interact or to come into contact with anyone who's lost. No, he is cleansed 
And He remains what He is. But He's sent into the world, and He's not to be of the world. And so He is supposed to give the world something. Listen, listen to me now. You see a guy, last week I got to hear hundreds of testimonies of people who were absolutely not just addicted to, to things, but I mean who actually were to the point. One guy, he said, he said, my nickname was worthless. He said, my nickname was worthless, and he says, because that's what I was. People would say, hey, worthless. And I was. He said, I heard everybody I ever knew. He said, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't. There's, there's nothing about me that's worth anything. I never helped anybody. I never did anything for anybody. If I came into contact with somebody, I hurt them. And he said, by the time I came to full circle of my addiction, he said, I was just worthless. He said, I could, I could, I, I didn't even have a brain. I was, I was like, I wasn't even a person. And he said, the world was just done with me. There was nothing left to plunder from me. I was worthless. I watched person after person testify of that. And then God saved them. God delivered them. And God changed their life. And now they're serving the Lord. And, they're, and when you see a guy like that, and he says, I was worthless. But he's ministering to people and trying to reach people. He's not like them. Listen, he's not an addict, addict and he never will be again. He's never going back. But the people he goes to would say, what happened to you? See, he's, he's ministering, he's working with people who are what he was. And he's not going to reach them by being like them. He's reaching them by them knowing he was like them, but he's changed. He has a message. He has something he can do. He's changed people's lives. He's not worthless. He's serving God. He's accomplishing a purpose for God. It's a wonderful thing. You know, my friend, you can look at someone like they say, well, I never, I never was... Well, you never were dysfunctional because of sin, maybe. In other words, maybe you, you can hold a job. Maybe, uh, maybe you're a good spouse, good father, good mother, good whatever it is. But you're a sinner. And in comparison with God, my friend, there's separation, isn't there? But when we've become holy, listen, you can go to a workplace where somebody doesn't know Jesus and they don't have joy. And I have a relationship with God. And when life's problems come, when there's sickness or disease or hardship or adversity, and you have everything that you need in Jesus, and you still have joy and peace, and you still have God's goodness and blessing in your life, and it doesn't matter what happens to you, you're just fine. There's people. There are people that say, I don't have that. See, we're supposed to go to the world with what God has done for us, what God has made us. Now today I want to look at the call to separation, just in case you're saying, well, pastor, you're preaching from an Old Testament text of Scripture, and don't you know, don't you know, you know, that was to Israel, and it was, um, you, you know, it was planned or intended, you know, to be prophetic about Israel's plan in the future. No, it's, it's actually a passage of Scripture where Isaiah shares an encounter that he had with God. And don't you know that God is just like Jesus? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And do you know that when God wanted His people, the, the nation of Israel, to be separated from the rest of the world, from the rest of the nations, for a testimony to His name, do you know that um, that was distinct for a nation? But did you know that we are a royal priesthood? And that we're a group of people that are supposed to be distinctly set apart to God? And I want to just see that in the New Testament. Will you please find... Uh, Romans chapter 1 in, in the, your copy of the Scripture this morning. Or just find Romans chapter 1. And I would like to look at positional separation. Positional separation. And I, I define, I guess, the use of the term this morning because I want us to not be confused. I don't want you to go away from here thinking that your separation is because of what you do. In other words... When I use the word positional, in my mind, I'm thinking of the word that's used over and over again in, in the book of Romans, the letter to the church in Rome, the word justified or justification, being justified. Uh, and the word justified is used in a tense that we would understand in, uh, I'm sorry, it, it's, it's, a, it's a word that's used in um, 
a tense that we would understand in the English language, kind of like the present, but it's one of those presents in the, in the language that it's written in that would carry with it the idea of having begun at a certain point. That is, at your cleansing. A person who's justified, the word means, it's a, it's a derivative of the word that we use for righteous. But it's a... Uh, it's an active or a, it's it's a it's an active voice type of a word that is it's it's something I'm sorry passive voice type of word meaning that it is done to someone in other words um, if you were to be drenched by a bucket of water if, in other words maybe uh, I don't know how many of y'all watched the championship game and then I watched the Cleveland Cavaliers get swept and blown out and made to look like a college collegiate team or whatever by the Warriors the other night. But if you watch, you know, people getting water dumped on them and that sort of thing. In other words, when you get soaked or you get drenched, it's something somebody does to you, normally not something you do to yourself unless you're doing one of these trendy ALS ice bucket challenge kind of things where you, you know. Anyway, my point is this is something done to you. If I were today, uh, probably there's one person in this room I could do it to and he wouldn't hold a grudge against me. If I were to take a bucket of water, y'all know who I'm talking about, right? The person that wouldn't get mad at me if I did to his Taj. If I were to take a bucket of water and soak Taj or drench Taj with a bucket of water, okay, he would be drenched, but he would not be responsible for being drenched. In other words, it would be because I did it to him, not because he did it. So maybe it's 4th of July. Yep. for instance, and uh, he's coming over to my house, and he, were you there when I did this? You know no, about I this? I heard the story. Okay, yeah, this, this actually did happen. Uh, we were washing cars. I had summer interns, they want to wash their cars in my house on 4th of July, and Taj ran to pick up somebody or do something, and he came back to my house. He comes down the street, and we're washing cars, and I have a bucket of sudsy water, and I thought it'd be nice, and I'll wash Taj's car. So when he pulled up, I was just going to throw the suds, the, the suds, on his car, right? Well, he starts honking his horn as he pulls up to uh, to my house, and I start to throw, I'm behind the vehicle, and I step out from the vehicle, I'm throwing the suds onto his car, and while I'm throwing the suds onto his car, he's got his finger on his window button, rolling his window down. Sometimes, you know, water comes out of a bucket and just kind of goes, Fwah! everywhere. No, this came out in a, in, you know, a bundle. <laughs> window sized bundle and literally maybe a couple of drops of water got on his car but all the rest of it went right in his window <laughs> oh, no. i just soaked him and we found out that the uh, galaxy fives are actually waterproof just like they're just like they're advertised to be and so well, we learned a lot of profitable things that day okay that has nothing to do with what we're talking about but in other words i soaked him he didn't make a choice i want to be soaked or, or something like that. You understand passive? The word justified me doesn't mean I got my act together, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and put on my suspenders, and now I'm righteous. No, it means God made me righteous. Just like Isaiah had a coal from the fire on the altar touch his lips and said, this hath made you clean. Isaiah didn't make himself clean. God cleansed him. And we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's how we're justified. When we get justified, it isn't something that we did. And so when I say positional sanctification, sanctified uh, means holy, it means cleansed, it means righteous. It means holy, really. A person who's holied, if you will, or justified. Or I use the word justified this way, righteous. Uh, you make a, a word that's a noun, and I turn it into a, an, um, an active verb, or and actually... It's in a passive sense. In other words, I was righteous when I called on the name of the Lord to be saved. It was not because of what I did. It was because of what God did for me, and I simply received it. So it happened to me. God made me righteous when I received Jesus as my Savior. And so positionally, I'm righteous. Positionally. I mean, seriously. Uh, Jesus gave His whole life for me, so... He didn't just die for me up until the point I was born again. He gave His life for my life. So my, the entire score of every sin I could tally up in my entire life, whether before saved or after saved, Jesus died for all of it. He gave His life for me. And He did not die figuratively. He died actually. 
He actually died on a cross, being the sinless Son of God, having never sinned. He actually died for my actual sin. And so actually, God's not naive about this. He doesn't have this, you know, I don't want to believe this about Jesus. No, Jesus actually died for my sin. Actually was dead and buried and was actually risen again. And so God said, you get what Jesus is. You're a sinner. Jesus died for sin. You're dead. Dead to sin. And he's talking about positionally being dead to sin. Now, there are actual ramifications of my being dead positionally. But as far as God's concerned, I'm dead. Jesus died for me, and I'm actually dead. And then Jesus rose again, and I identified with his life. I got his death, and I got his life. <laughs> and I'm actually alive. I'm actually righteous. Now, does that mean I don't sin? <laughs> I don't sin. Come on, people. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that at all. I'm positionally sanctified, though. You see what I'm saying? In other words, because of what Jesus actually did for me, I'm actually righteous. And I'm supposed to live like it because I'm supposed to be separated. That's part of separation is living like what I actually am. I'm actually God's son. Uh, my sins are actually paid for. I'm actually alive spiritually, and I'll never die. I have eternal life. That's actually true. And that's my position. So when we talk about positional separation, that's what we're talking about. What we actually are because of what Jesus actually did. It's a reality of... of our position, our place in Christ. And this is so rich. I hope it doesn't just, you don't just say, Pastor, you're, you're you know, going on and on and on. Uh, I'm telling you, this is so rich. It is so helpful for us to understand these truths. Now, here we are in Romans chapter 1, and I want to read verse 1. In his introduction, Paul said this, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, notice the next word, called to be an apostle. Well, that was for Paul only, wasn't it? And then he said, separated unto the gospel of God. Now there's a word there, isn't there, that we're using in our series. Separation. Paul is separated unto the gospel of God. We know what he's separated from, right? He was the chief of sinners before he was born again. Now he has been separated from what he was, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised, uh, you know, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel and knowing his heritage and then being taught under Gamaliel and, and uh, some say being even in line maybe uh, to be the next high priest. I don't understand how that could be true if he's from the tribe of Benjamin, but I've heard people say that, that he was studying, you know, to be the next high priest. I don't think so. But he certainly was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. When he got saved, he became the premier uh, teacher, really, of the apostles who explained the law and grace. I mean, just the person who helped us to understand uh, the, that salvation is not by the works of the law, but it's by grace. And he understood the law so well uh, that the Holy Spirit of God just took him and used him to expound those things in all the, in all the epistles as well as Romans. And so, uh, this is Paul. Now look at verse 7. He said in verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 6 I meant to say, not verse 7. He said, among whom, it's speaking of the nations, among whom are ye also the, what's the next word? Called of Jesus Christ. My friend, your sanctification and my sanctification is a calling. In other words, what happened when Isaiah had the tongue, the coal from the fire put on his lips and the seraphim said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, you're clean. You've been cleansed. Well, then he was called. And said, The Lord, who will go for us? And who shall I send? And so I, here am I, send me. Called. Called. My friend, you and I have a calling. I just want to, I just want to look at this theme. I go to 1 Corinthians, right after Romans. So if you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, X, Romans, then find 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. And will you please look, it's, this is in the greeting portion of this letter to the church at Corinth. Will you look with me please to verse 2. Paul is called to be an apostle, but he says in verse 2, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are, what's that next word? Sanctified, sanctified in Christ Jesus. And what does the word sanctified mean? It's cleansed, clean, made holy, 
See, my friend, separation is because of sanctification. And sanctification is actually not because we've made ourselves holy. Sanctification is actually because we've been made to be holy. Sanctified. Who sanctified them? Jesus did. God did. It was through Christ. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. What's that next phrase? Called to be saints. Now the word saint is the same word we get from holy. Hagios. Holy ones. Holy. Called to be holy. What is our reason for separating? See, holiness separates, doesn't it? Let me just, let's just throw holiness into genres, shall we? Uh, rap. Hmm? Sanctified, holy, sinless. Uh, the character of God, rap. I'm talking about the genre of music in case you all think I'm talking about Christmas presents. I'm rap. Not W, just R-A-P. The genre. Would you call it holy? Sanctified? No. no. Okay, let's scratch that one. Uh, country and Western? No. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, classical music. Let's just talk about music like classical. The classics. Rembrandt and, uh, you know, um, and then what's it? Mozart? Actually, yeah, Mozart. Actually, if you study, if you study the authors of the classics, and especially if you study, Anthony told me this the other day. He said, "You know, I like the French." He said, "They gave us the Statue of Liberty. I like the French." And then he said, "And they're, you know, so much art. Most of it's bad art, but I like the French." Very <laughs> hard. This is Anthony's commentary. I know why he's going off about the French yesterday. Well, he started off by saying, "I don't like the French," and then he decided he did like the French. Just talking about the French, France, the French, and he was just saying, but you know what? A lot of things. A lot of people think, oh, you know, classical's good, rap's bad, or country and western's bad. Well, you know, classical's kind of wicked, actually. You know, the whole genre of um, uh, of uh, what's it called? Uh, opera, the opera. Friend, be careful. Don't read the words. What's that? It's evil. Are you sanctified? Let's, let's throw the word holy. Let's throw the word sanctified into opera. Now, it's, it is ironic to me that each of these genres have been repurposed into Christianity for worship. But the genre is what it is. It, represent, it represents what it represents. And I just don't think gangster and holy are the same. I don't think the immorality and the illicit drugs and uh, fornication that goes along with a uh, rock really goes with holy. Now you say, Pastor, that's your opinion. Yeah, it is my opinion. I just told you my opinion. That's my opinion. And I would like to hear from somebody who wants to talk about holiness and has a different opinion. Well, I, I, I remember, this, this has made such an impression on me. A Christian opera singer, and I, I know that those seem like oxymorons, but I, th I don't question the man's salvation, but a Christian opera singer performed in our church our independent fundamental Baptist church in the middle in the Midwest on a Sunday morning and my dad got up and walked out. I know he's so upset about it. I mean, this guy's you know on a faculty of a Christian college and he's an opera singer. And my dad said he said when I was in college he said the the opera was the homosexual movement. It was the most wicked. It was that culture. He says and they brought that in church. It offended him, deeply offended him. You know why? Because I guess what opera represents doesn't quite coincide with holiness. Uh, and you could just go on and on and on, couldn't you? I'm just talking about genres of music, but you know, music really defines people, doesn't it? And Christian, I just want to submit to you. I just, I just want to, to give you for your consideration the information and just ask you the question. If we're called to be saints... We're supposed to be in the world. What ought to be our identity? Anthony told me this yesterday. He said, when I was in junior high, he said they called me the Bible guy. His, his math teacher, I didn't know this. I'd have done something about it. But his math teacher told him, put it away. Because he had it on his desk. He said, put it away. But he used to carry his Bible in, in, uh, in uh, middle school. He got called the Bible guy. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time finding a problem with that. 
I mean, if it's for some, you know, piety or, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I carry a Bible, so I'm a great Christian. And if it's for that reason, of course, that's just pride. Sure. But if his identity is, I love Jesus and I love the Word of God, I just want to have it around me so I can open it whenever I want to. It seems to coincide, doesn't it? With, with being called to testify. Our response. And the Holy Spirit of God convicts me a lot of times. You know, yesterday I didn't respond very well. Uh, I was just being transparent with you. I went to Ace Hardware to get a screw, and uh, it, it, the, the total of what I needed to buy was only 58 cents. And they told me I couldn't use a debit card. I didn't have any cash on me. And the guy said, I'm sorry, it's just our policy. You know, as far as I know, that we had legislation that said that banks could not charge institutions a uh, transaction charge for using a debit card. Now maybe whoever does their service uh, on their machine or whatever, but it's just a courtesy service, isn't it? I mean, if people, we're just kind of in a, I used all my cash last week. I had no cash on me. We're really in a society where pretty much you can pay anywhere with a card. And we need to get ready for the mark of the beast anyway. So I mean, we've got to, you know, we've got to have these things. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think that or believe that, but I'm just being funny. Uh, but it was irritating to me. I was in a hurry, supposed to meet somebody. I'm like, so I went out to the car and I stole Melissa's Aldi quarters. She's got to have quarters for when she shops at Aldi so she can put them in the shopping cart, you know. And now she's going to have to carry boxes out of Aldi instead of using the shopping cart. <laughs> because they took her Aldi money. And the guy came, he says, you know, it's not me, it's just a policy. And I said something like, well, you know, it's just a stupid policy. You know, that wasn't very nice, was it? That represent very well for sanctified. Nope. I had to go back in, and I had to say, you know, it's really not the whole scheme of life. It's really not such a big deal. I'm sorry I got upset about that. To the guy, you know, I'm never shopping there again. <laughs> <laughs> that was irritating. No, you know how we how we carry ourselves, how we respond can really be reflected in our call to sanctification, can't it? Let's, let's rattle through a bunch of verses just so we can reinforce what we've said here real quickly. Uh, will you uh, find 1 Corinthians chapter 6 since you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, in verse 11. This is talking about what we were and it says in verse 11, such were some of you, it's talking about all the sins, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I want to read to you, it's, it's next to Revelation, but Jude chapter 1 and, and verse 1, uh, just really a page in most people's Bibles. Uh, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. My friend, can I say to you that our sanctification is a calling? When the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Could I say to you that that is the call to sanctification? That's what we're called to. Listen, separation and sanctification are interchangeable in context here. The notion that we've been made holy means we're sanctified. Do you see it? See, what separated us from God was our sin because He was holy and we are unclean. But when we were sanctified, it's what identified us with God. A royal priesthood called to be sanctified. And my friend, that is what we are positionally. In other words, we are positionally sanctified, and that means that it is our calling to practice separation. Now again, separation is not snobbishness. I had rather be a lost, profane, vile person and deal with a sanctified uh, Christian when I tell them they can't use their debit card. Wouldn't you? There's nothing obnoxious about somebody acting sanctified, is there? It really isn't. I mean, just the fruit of the Spirit and the graciousness of a person. I had rather entrust. 
I had rather entrust a task or uh, something uh, that I value, maybe a, uh, even my, you know, a vehicle or whatever. I'd rather entrust it to somebody who's sanctified. Wouldn't you? You ought to be able to trust someone who's sanctified. There ought to be a difference in how they respond to you because of their call to sanctification. Our sanctification is position. Let's look at a couple more verses. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1. If you're still in 1 Corinthians, mm. then you can go over to Ephesians. It's Galatians and then Ephesians. And chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Again, we are saints. That means holy one. We are positionally separated because of what we are. Philippians, the next uh, letter in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. We're called to be saints. Colossians, right after uh, Philippians chapter 1, and verse 2. Uh, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our position in Jesus Christ is that of saints. And my friend, it reflects the call to separation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto, what's that next word? Holiness. Holiness. When the seraphim cried out, what did they cry? Holy. holy, holy, holy. And we are called to be holy, holy, holy. It's our calling as saints. Hebrews uh, chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, looking down to verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. What is the heavenly calling? Is there a clue anywhere in the Scriptures? Holiness. <coughs> Holiness. When Isaiah saw the Lord, what did he see? Holiness. What's our heavenly calling? Holiness. Chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Hebrews and verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now I want to dwell on this just for a, 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 a I don't know, a 30 second minute if I can. Um, last week when I went to the Reformers Unanimous I started feeling really good about my going over on time when I preach sometimes because my friend, the, those people are the biggest liars about when their service times ended. You know, every time I started yelling, liar! Whenever they'd say, I'm going to have you out of here by, they said they were going to have, I'm going to have you out of here by 11.30. It's 12.30 when we left. We're at a banquet. We're going to have you all out of here by 8.30. It was 9.30 by the time we left. And they're, oh, we're just going to share a two-minute testimony. Quick two-minute testimony is like 20 minutes for a testimony. Where is another two minutes? And I'm just like, liar! You know, one guy actually said, he said, why do we say two-minute testimony? It's not going to be two minutes. Now, why do we say that? You know, so I'm just telling you, I'm going to have you all here. I don't know, you know, I hope you brought a lunch. I hope you don't have diabetes or something. If you need to get up and, you know, put some insulin in you or something like that, I just don't disturb anybody so you can make it. <laughs> Verse 10 of Hebrews uh, 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Positional sanctification happens not because of anything that we've done. Positional sanctification happens because of what Jesus did for us. We are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. In other words, that is showing means there. It's showing how it is that we're sanctified. How are you made holy? Okay. Jesus made you holy. That's how. Jesus did it. Let's say it together. Jesus did it. Jesus. Let me ask you. How are you made holy? Jesus. Jesus did it. So why are you sanctified? Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Okay, so your sanctification is not something you can say, you know, I'm sanctified. How about you? Sanctified? Didn't think so. No, you're sanctified because Jesus did it. Can you take credit for something Jesus did? No. I mean, you can live it, and we're going to look at how to live sanctification and why we should live it. But my friend, sanctification is not anything to be proud about. It's something to be pleased about, but not proud about. Because Jesus did it. 
We're sanctified by Jesus Christ. You understand what positional sanctification is? Positional sanctification is something that happened to us. It's our justification or our being made justified or holy. But we didn't do it. And, and consequently, we can't take credit for it and we can't unsanctify ourselves positionally either, right? In other words, what kind of people does Jesus sanctify? Unclean people. What kind of people are sanctified? Unclean people. That's what you are. Why are you sanctified? Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Yeah. Okay, does that help you? I'm going to help you with how to live the sanctified life. But a lot of times Christians can't figure out how to live like they're sanctified because they think that they have to do it. Boy, you get confused about that. You'll get discouraged in a hurry. Man, I mean, you'll have a good day and you'll be on the ball and you'll say, well, you know, I live sanctified today. You know, I, I can understand why God would save me. Next day you'd say, God, I don't think you did save me. How can I be... <clears throat> why? Because you think it's you that did it. But it's Jesus that did it. Right? Okay? Positional sanctification is an important concept. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up uh, chapter 14 of Hebrews and verse 29. For your reference, if you're jotting notes, you could remember Colossians 3.12 and 1 Peter 2.9, but we won't have time this morning to be there. So let's go to Hebrews... Uh, I, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 14. I, I said that wrong. I, I confused myself in my notes. Hebrews 10.14. For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If Jesus did it, how long is it done for? A person who's positionally sanctified, how long is he perfected? Forever. Forever. Has there ever been a person who has been made to be holy who actually themselves have not sinned from that point forward? <laughs> Only if they died right away. I want to tell a story about our milkman, but we're out of time. If you want to know a story about our milkman, I'll tell you about it. But uh, he believed in uh, perfection, what they call it, the something perfection. There. Sinless. sinless perfection. He believed in sinless perfection. He believed he wasn't a sinner. And it was crazy, you know, the things that he did that were sin, how he explained it. <laughs> My friend, we're, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And I want to conclude uh, with some practical application here today. The first way that we can be practical in our application is to ask the question, have you had that experience? Has it happened to you? You ever had the woe is me moment? Like Isaiah did? I'm unclean. I do, I, I, everything about me is unclean. Everyone around me is unclean. God, you're holy. Woe is me. When you realize that, God's ready to help you. I'll clean you. Cleanse you. I had one. I mean, when I, when I was a child, my mom has a recording of me. I, I need to get a copy of it before the tape degrades. I need to digitize it and sell it for millions. She has a recording of me when I was probably like three years old and she was asking me if I was a sinner. And I said, no. I knew what the word meant. When, my, when I was about three, my brother was about one and a half, almost two. I was acting up in Sunday school class because I was unsaved at that point. I haven't acted up since. You know, you all in Sunday school class, they know that's true. But I was misbehaving in Sunday school. My mom said, Ryan, what has gotten into you? This is not like you. I said, oh, I guess I must be hanging around Daniel too much. That's my little one-and-a-half-year-old yeah, brother. That's true. Yeah. Anybody knows him knows it actually is true too. <laughs> yeah, actually, anyway, so <laughs> I wish you were here. Uh, but the reason I was acting up is I was a sinner. And so my mom asked me when I was three. She had a recording. She said, are you a sinner? I said, no. And she says, Mama Center? Yes. Daddy yeah. Center? Yes. Grandma Center? Yes. Grandpa Center? Yes. Is Jenny a Center? Yes. Is Daniel Center? Yes. Are you a Center? No. I mean, on and on and on and on and on. And uh, I'm quite convinced that that's the way I felt about it. You know, I, I had a pretty good impression of my goodness. And I knew that anything that I'd been. Um, coerced into was probably the fault of my one and a half year old brother uh, for sure but the reality of it is is that you know about a year and a half later there was an evangelist that he was kind of a wild crazy man he used to go around town shouting things to people on his megaphone preaching the gospel 
Now, he was a little bit of an extremist, a little bit fringe, if you uh, put it that way. And uh, my grandma brought him home, and he ended up going home with my dad. My grandpa said, get that guy out of here. I don't want that guy around my house. And so my dad ended up bringing him home. He stayed the night in our house at least once. And uh, <laughs> we were getting ready to go to bed. I was brushing my teeth. We only had one bathroom, so everybody's brushing their teeth at the same time. And uh, he said, Ryan, have you ever been saved? And I said, no, but my sister is. And I told about how my sister had received Jesus as her Savior. You know, she had, uh, I just told the story. You don't need to hear the story, but... It was a story in our family, and, and I told him about that. And that was always my answer. Anytime I got asked, are you born again? If you, are you saved? You know, have you received Jesus as your Savior? Even as a child, I just throw the distraction at him. Like, well, let me tell you about my sister. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't answer the question. And so he listened to the story, and then he said, yeah, but what about you? Are you saved? Well, nobody ever did that to me before. Everybody just took the distraction and let me do it. You know, and all of a sudden, I had to deal with the reality that I was not saved. And it occurred to me at that moment, that was a problem. Because I actually saw God as holy. And I saw myself as a sinner. That was the reality of it. And I knew as a child that if I died, I'd go to hell because of the separation between me and God. Now, I couldn't articulate in those terms, of course. Close to those terms, but not quite exactly. But I prayed something like this that night. I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sins and I want to be saved. God, I want you to save me because of what Jesus did. And guess what? I got justified. I got sanctified. I was cleansed. I was perfected forever huh, by Jesus Christ. And my friend, I have been positionally holy ever since. But I had an encounter when I was four years old. Not quite five. I had an encounter with God. And I was sanctified. God did it. I just made the choice to let Him. To ask Him to. Everybody needs to do that. It might be that you're, you're a church body. You're one of those people that, you know, you've always gone to church. But I'm not like you, to be frank with you. I grew up going to church, but if I weren't sanctified, I wouldn't. But you might be one of those folks that feels good about being religious. I don't like religious people, so it doesn't make me feel good. But uh, that may be you. And you could think that, like I said when they'd ask if I was born again, you could think that saying, when someone asks you, have you ever been saved? you ever been born again? You could think that saying, well, I've gone to church my whole life. Like that's a good answer. But it's as good an answer as I gave when I said no to my sister is. Church doesn't do anything for you. My sister being saved didn't do anything for me. You get sanctified by making a decision. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want heaven to be my eternal home. I want to receive God. And my friend, it's just as simple as asking God, whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the first practical implication of what we've learned today. And the second one is going to become more practical when we look at practicing sanctification in next week. The second one is to recognize that your holiness comes not from what you have done, but from what you have been made to be. You'll never get it right if you think it's what you do that makes you holy. It's what has been done to you, what God has done for you that makes you holy. And you'll never, you'll never get spiritual victory. You'll always struggle. You won't be able to, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit of God says, that's, puts His finger on your life and says, that's problematic. You'll struggle with it and you won't have victory because you think sanctification is because of what you do instead of what's been done for you and then you won't know how to get God's help with what you do. So that's the message for today. I want to ask everyone to have their heads bowed and eyes closed at this time. I'm just going to have an invitation on the basis of those two things that we've seen today. If out of respect for every other person here this morning, you'd be careful to have your eyes closed and not look around so that every person could have the same privacy that you would desire. I'd like to ask the first question, and that is, have you been born again? Have you been sanctified? Here this morning, and uh, the answer would be no but anything. Whatever the anything is, is it won't suffice. So I'm going to ask the question, and if you have not been born again, would you just slip your hand up? I'll ask it this way. Do you need to be born again? Do you need to be sanctified? If that's you, you're here this morning with no one looking around, and I won't call you out or embarrass you. Uh, would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, God's shown me the Holy Spirit is working in my heart because I need to be sanctified. 
Would you just slip your hand up? I need that positional sanctification. Slip your hand up. That's you. Okay, the second question this morning. If God has shown you today from the Scripture that not only are you sanctified positionally because of what Jesus has done, but that it's your calling. And in some ways, your thinking has been rearranged or framed differently. And you realize that, you know, God, I've tried to act like I'm sanctified, or I've tried to do what you've already done for me, or I've taken credit for something you've done for me. And I really need to be able to rest in this position that has been given to me by the work of the cross. And God's shown you that, and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure exactly how to do this, but I've got my thinking rearranged, and I need God's help to not only remember, but to be able to learn to practice this truth in my life. Uh, God's shown me this, and my thinking is, is going to be changed, but I just want to commit it to the Lord right now, and I'd like you to pray for me. Just slip your hand up. Slip your hand up all over him. Okay, just slip it up. Slip it right back down. I see that. I see those? Okay. I'm going to pray for you right now. And uh, as I pray, would you just ask God, would you just ask God, God, make this my way of thinking. Help me never to forget what it means to be sanctified positionally. Father, thank you for what you've shown us. Thank you for what you've shown us here today. Positional sanctification is oh so important. And God, as, as we grow in Jesus Christ, we really come to the seasoned understanding that what we do in the flesh, we are such failures at. And so often it's because we think wrong. And I pray for individuals that have been helped with their thinking to understand positional sanctification this morning, that God, that you would just give them practical answers and help them to be able to rest and what you've done for them so that then they can learn how to live the way that they're called. Thank you for the, the message this morning. Thank you for what you've taught us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence and help here today. Go with us now as we dismiss. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your attention this morning. You're dismissed.